Hello, I'm Bill McCreary. And I'm Jerry Lisker. And today we will take a look at the sport of boxing before and after Mike Tyson. What effect will his rape conviction have on the sport? We're proud to have with us today five world champions and other boxing notaries. They had to do what they do best, talk about boxing. Don't go away, in just a moment we'll have round one by controversy always had its ups and downs. One might say that from its very beginning, boxing has had a black eye. Tyson, the youngest man to ever climb to the top of the heap and heavyweight ranks, seemed to have a certain place in the annals of boxing. Despite his undisputed talents, that place is now unclear because of his troubles outside the ring. Controversy, of course, is no stranger to this unique sport. By its very nature, it could be expected that some of the bad boys of society, its outcasts and questionable characters, would be attracted to boxing. The bare-knuckled brawls of the late 19th century could rightly be called barely organized mayhem. Bouts were staged in barrooms, on barges, and in backwoods. There were no time limits. The winner declared when his opponent was literally disabled. John L. Sullivan, the last of the bare-knuckled heavyweight champs, was almost as well known for his two-fisted drinking as for his ring prowess. The entire proceeds of his title bout with Jack Kilrain was a $10,000 side bet with the challenger after he won the 75-round brawl. Sullivan was arrested by 16 police officers for that illegal prize fight. The controversial heavyweight title match between Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey in 1896 was refereed by the legendary Western gunman Wyatt Earp. Earp reportedly had bet heavily on Sharkey. When Fitzsimmons KO'd the challenger, Earp ruled it a foul and awarded victory to Sharkey. Pat Masterson, another figure from the Old West, became a regular fixture in the squared circle. That was because he was good at confiscating guns and knives many spectators typically carried into the open air arenas. He's the third man in the ring here as Fitzsimmons KO's ex-champ Jim Corbett. In this 1909 fight, Stanley Ketchell, who had become middleweight champ, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the first black heavyweight title holder, Jack Johnson. Ketchell was one of many so-called great white hopes, first believed capable of taking Johnson's crown. One year after being whipped by Johnson, a farmer put two bullets in Ketchell's brain for seducing his daughter. Johnson, for his blackness and his boldness, became one of the most controversial men in America. He KO'd Tommy Burns to take the title in 1908. Police stepped in to turn off the movie camera at the climax of the one-sided battle. After Johnson whipped James Jeffries in 1910, race riots broke out in many American cities when movies of the fight were shown. That led Congress to ban interstate distribution of boxing films. Johnson further angered white America by opening a saloon and by marrying a white woman. After she committed suicide in 1912, Johnson was convicted of violating the Mann Act, a federal law drawn up specifically with him as its target, even though the supposed female victim transported across state lines for immoral purposes had been his own legally wedded spouse. Johnson responded by jumping bail and living overseas for eight years. During that time, he married another white woman. Johnson lost a controversial match to Jess Willard in 1915 in Havana, Cuba. He claimed he threw the fight in the 26th round. Well, later he gave himself up to U.S. authorities at the Mexican border and served a year in prison at Leavenworth, Kansas. So the fight game has shadow boxed with controversy and has had some rather unique characters for much of its history. The case of Mike Tyson is but the latest episode to focus the public spotlight on the sport. You know, a lot of people are probably wondering about the legal ramifications of what happened to Mike Tyson. I spoke to a boxing attorney about Mike Tyson's legal situation. And I spoke with Lou Falcino, one of the titans of pay-per-view, and that's what this is all about, boxing and money. Will Tyson be able to fight while he's out on appeal? Well, there's no legal prohibition about his fighting. It's up to the individual state commissions. You have, and the state commissions have a right to allow him to fight, to license him. In fact, certain state commissions have had convicted felons fighting. I mean, he's convicted, but he's still out on appeal. But some commissions feel that the person is entitled to make a living. 
Um, but then you have a situation of whether the networks will buy the fight, whether the television exhibitors will buy the fight, whether the hotels will buy the fight. Then it becomes a public relations, not a legal issue. Right. Now, would uh, Tyson be allowed to fight while in prison? Well, it depends very much on what the prison officials of that particular, particular state would allow him to do. They have the right to allow him to fight or not to fight. We had a case in New Jersey, James Scott, mm -hmm. who was in Raw Rawway State Prison and had the right to fight while he was in prison. There's another uh, fighter right now incarcerated, Tony Ayala, who's in fact incarcerated for rape. And I don't know if he's tried to fight, but he has not been able to fight. It's pretty much up to the prison control board or whatever supervising agency takes care of that prison, and they have a right to decide that. What impact will the Tyson sentencing have on the sport of boxing? Well, on the financial impact, understand Mike is probably a billion dollar industry in himself. Uh, uh, Mike can get a hundred million dollars a fight, not as a salary, but he can gross, the promotion can gross a hundred million dollars a salary uh, per fight, ten fights, that's a billion dollars. Um, Will the boxing industry lose a billion dollars because of Mike Tyson? No. Uh, other people will step in to fill the void. Uh, I don't think they'll fill it completely. Uh, Hollifield can fight Holmes. He can fight uh, uh, Foreman again. Fight Bo. Holmes can fight uh, Foreman. They're all good fights. They're all pay-per-view fights. And as the pay-per-view universe grows, the dollars increase. Uh, we have a fight next month with Mancini and Hazen. Small fight, not heavyweights, but it'll still do several million dollars. Uh, but nobody out there will do the kind of business that Mike Tyson does. We'll be right back after this timeout. Spinks, former Olympic champion, light heavyweight and heavyweight champion of the world. The undisputed middleweight champion of the world, now retired, Vito Antofermo. Jose Torres, former light heavyweight champion of the world, former chairman, New York State Boxing Commission and author of Fire and Fear, the inside story of Mike Tyson. The welterweight champion of the world, Maurice Blocker. Richie Frazier, three-time Golden Glove champion, world amateur champ, and a light heavyweight at that, and he's also a member of New York's finest. The GQ Man of the Year, the stylish, the bright, the witty. Boxing promoter and manager, Butch Lewis. Larry Hazard, New Jersey Boxing Commissioner, was the premier referee in the United States for quite a while, a former high school principal and former amateur boxer. Now this question is to everyone on the panel, and I don't want you all to answer at the same time, but the rape conviction of Mike Tyson, has it given boxing a black eye? The question is, is unfair because that's what happens. Boxing has been put on trial when actually it should not have been. Uh, I think that it's a tragedy that something like this happens and that it, it makes headlines all over the world. And for people, the public in particular, they feel that boxing, the boxers in particular, are brutes. Uh, in fact, I, I, if I'm not mistaken from me following the case in the, in, the, in the media, he was portrayed as a brute, an animal, and so forgive him. This is just his nature. That's not the case with boxers. Boxers are some of the most humble, uh, nonviolent type people you ever want to meet outside of the ring. This is a profession that, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's sad that it, it happened that boxing is on trial. Mike Tyson and the young lady that were involved, nobody's a winner in this. Uh, hopefully, uh, the public does realize that no blanket should be thrown over everyone in boxing. For Just like no one is held responsible for the acts of others in everyday life or in everyday prof professions. Uh, so why boxing? When, when something happens in boxing, everybody's to blame, and everybody suffers to, to an extent. Tyson was not born a champion. He was taught to be a champion. And to be a champion of the world, you need to have the capacity to learn. 
So I think that when Coach D'Amato took Mike Tyson, and he began to work on him and to engineer Tyson, and to try to transpose off of those bad qualities that he had, and transpose that into the ring, and Tyson became a guy, for example, who had an absolute control of his emotions inside the ring, because if you, if you lose your emotion inside the ring, you cannot be champion of the world. Tyson dirt with fear. He was a guy who was able to control fear, to use fear for his own benefit. Tyson had an incredible sense of anticipation, which means that he knew when the other guy was gonna throw a punch before he did it. He had a great sense of timing, which is the important thing, with it, with, which is what separates champion from ordinary fighters, is timing, the control of fear, and the control of the emotion. Those things, he was not born with that. They were put into his brains by a, a, a teacher. In this case, was Coach Yamato. Tyson, yeah. inside the ring, has all that control I was talking about. But that's inside the ring. Outside the ring, Tyson is a different person. He loses control. He becomes very immature, and he becomes like a kid. Now that he, had, that he has tasted good life, and going back to the can could be disastrous for him and his liable to commit suicide. I still don't know what what really happened up there. And well, really, you know, I mean, just because he was convicted, I, I still don't believe that Tyson would do something. I mean, I know him personal. I, Mike happens to be a nice guy. First off, I'd like to say that, number one, I think that as far as the arrest and the conviction is concerned, I think that Mike Tyson's total defense team did a real poor job. That's number one. Um, I, don't, I don't personally believe that things happen exactly the way that they were alleged to have happened in that room in Indianapolis. That's number one. Number two, I think that we're talking about a persona here. We're talking about a Mike Tyson, the heavyweight champion of the world, the most coveted title in all of sport. That's why I think that the focus is so much on boxing. I think that it's somewhat unfair for the whole sport of boxing to be indicted because of Mike Tyson. Now let's go back to Mike Tyson and his uh, childhood, his arrests and, and all of the problems that he had. Um, I think that Mike Tyson could be a re rehabilitated uh, in, in, in this respect, in that he is no different than any young man who grew up with a troubled past who changed. I think that much of the focus on Mike Tyson presently is, has only been because he was the world heavyweight champion. Well, it's a sad case. You, you, you had a heavyweight champion. You had a young heavyweight champion in, uh, who had everything. And for it to, uh, to turn out the way it did turn out, uh, it's sad. It's sad for everybody. And uh, I just hope uh, whatever happens to Mike that's in the future, that he could be rehabilitated and of course, in time, that he's going to be more mature and, and more, more accurate and aware of what he's doing in the future. Everybody don't know how to be a champion, even if there are champion Good point. on paper. All right? You have to act like a champion in the ring and out of the ring. And I feel Tyson failed to do that outside of the ring. And uh, he started getting in little spats here and there. You know? And he didn't have the right people around him tell him, like they said over here, you can't do that. Cut. You know, as far as, you know, I, I think he got railroaded a little bit. We'll be back with more after this timeout. About the same type of background, how did you avoid the potholes that Mike apparently has fallen into? I had a, a very caring mom, you know, which uh, was a lot of strength to me in my life. And uh, growing up in my neighborhood, a lot of guys that uh, did box, you know, went for a few times Leon and myself got jumped on by gangs of them uh, off and on so um, I kind of felt for that you know in, 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 in this sense where if, if I had ever became a, a good at what I did because I, I started boxing and all but wasn't good enough to really go for bad but I, I felt that if I I mean I, I said to myself if I was to ever become uh, good at what I did uh, boxer that I would uh, I just wouldn't waste talent on the streets and things of that nature. But I, I, I kind of like uh, what, uh, the, I mean, kind of like felt for what the commissioner was saying, how uh, the boxers and the around boxing stereotyped and, 
and things of that nature. I felt that, uh, and getting into the history of it and what they felt, uh, what they labeled us, labeled boxers as being, you know, uh, and through all the, the humble backgrounds and not being educated and all. I mean, I felt uh, at a disadvantage to the boxing world. I felt for the, for the love of the sport, for loving the sport that I so like to go and, 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 and participate in that I felt that I was being done a disjustice, a disjust, uh, injustice uh, for uh, just being rigged or, or labeled uh, nothing and nobody. You know, I mean, I, f I felt really angered toward that. So, I mean, I had an attitude for just uh, that particular thing. And what I did, for, what I said for myself was that I would never carry myself as a boxer. I would never uh, walk around punching on the streets. I mean, if uh, I was a boxer, you'd never know it. I mean, I just uh, felt, I just resented the fact that we were stereotyped and, and I resented the fact that they viewed us in, in this light. So I took pride in myself uh, just for, just not wanting to carry myself in that manner. There's a historical bias that has always been perpetuated against the sport of boxing. Historically, we have always been portrayed in the movies, in the media, as being a sport that, that's engulfed with unsavory characters. So Mike Tyson, with this situation, he fits a persona and almost a stereotype of the kid who came from the ghetto, who led a life of crime, reformatory, then uh, a surrogate father in Customata and, the, and, and the, the saviors coming to his aid. Then he, he climbs to become the heavyweight champion of the world, only to end up once again back where he started from. You see, the script almost is it's almost like a perfect script. So that's why there's such a great focus on the sport of boxing, because it has always historically been there. There's always been a, histor historically there's been a bias and a prejudice perpetuated against the sport of boxing. The tough kid from the east side versus the, 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 the tough kid from the west side. You know, uh, somebody up there likes me. You know, the whole thing that has been perpetuated through the movies and through the media. And we've never been able to shake that. And it's very well, unfair. Now, when Custom Auto passed on, another person took over the stewardship of Mike Tyson. How much influence do you think uh, that person had on what happened well, to well, Mike well, Tyson? Well, you see, you see, and, and, I, and I think you're talking and about... And I'm talking about Don King. You're talking about Don King. Right. And I think that, in all fairness to Don King, we have to understand that when he came into Mike Tyson's life, Mike Tyson was an adult. Mike Tyson had reached a point where he could at least decide how close he was going to let an individual get to him. Now, when he went to Custer Amata, he was a youngster. He was, he was entrusted to Custer Amata, and his motives also could have been a little bit different because he knew this was a chance to live in a nice surrounding and not in the reform school. Now he's the heavyweight champion of the world with plenty of success, plenty of money, and a great deal more maturity. So I can't blame Don King for what Mike Tyson has done because we don't really know how close Mike Tyson has allowed Don King to be in his life and how much influence he has allowed Don King to, to have on him. And not as only an that, I yeah. mean, yeah. Cuss, it, it, during the years with Cuss, and I'm sure Jose can attest to this, Mike Tyson was under Cuss's wing literally 24 hours a day uh, as, a, as a young man. In, in, in Don's situation, Mike's an adult. I mean, I, I, uh, I heard Mike tell the Don that, uh, you know, what am I under arrest? I have to stay. So he, he, he was his own man. But like anything else, if you are not groomed and taught and taken by hand, all of us were young. And any one of us sitting here can go back to our teen years, early 20s, we raised some cane. We didn't do everything that was right. So don't get the, it's, it's easy to throw stones at Mike Tyson. He comes from a humble background, no formal education, was blessed with a gift to perform in a profession of boxing. But that doesn't say because he did all of these things and generated millions and millions of dollars that he did not need that particular special grooming or that one person who Mike Tyson himself respected enough to say, okay, 
I'll listen to what you say. I believe that in the case of Tyson, when he was with Cos Amaro, and when he went with Don King, one thing was sure. It is true that he was a legal adult, but psychologically, he was an immature child. Tyson has that problem that he, he has trouble with maturity. He doesn't deal with the world with the, mature, the same maturity as a guy 25 years old. But Jose, Go ahead. I mean, in all fairness, in, the, in, the, in, in, his, in his background, and I'm, I'm not making excuses. Go ahead. No, no, no father image there in the house, no, but in whatever, the home, but no family. You know, let, me, let me tell you, I don't know what, where Butch Lewis would be in, in, if I didn't have a strong family structure around me, keeping me on the right path, because I, I grew up in That's the That's exactly too. what I'm saying. I'm saying that you are right. That Tyson, even though he must have been a legal, or he is a legal, much a legal adult, he's not, for whatever reason, including I'm not a psychiatrist, but because of his background, because of the way he's been treated, he needs supervision. Okay, but Jose, I got to add also. Why? Even though he 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 was legally an adult, we all are, are, are family men, and we have we have children, most right. of us, and you must admit that you must instill certain things into a youngster when he's a child. Therefore, following that concept, there were certain things that were not uh, addressed with Mike Tyson when he was 13, 14, 15 up, sure. years old when he was growing up. You see, because if you don't put this in a youngster when he's a child, by the time he becomes an adult, you know, it's almost like you can forget it. So I, I, I'm not making excuses for him either, and I'm not defending Don King, and I'm not pointing the finger at Cuss. But the motivation that was centered on Mike Tyson when he was living with Cus Damata and during his young years was simply to make him the heavyweight champion of the world. We'll be right back after this timeout. I think it would be the same without him. I mean, because especially he's from New York, and uh, he's like a hero. I think, and when they see an opportunity, opportunity where they can score with the individual that has a large amount of money, they make that move. There'll always be a soft spot in boxing's heart for him, but that's only because he was a champion, he was young, and this country idolizes youth, you know? But I just hope justice was served. He probably deserves the sentence that anyone who is convicted for the crime of rape, he shouldn't be any different from anyone else, just because he's a celebrity. Whatever the sentence is, 10 years, 15, 20, he deserved what he gets. What happens when the day comes when your kid said, Dad, I want to be just like you. I want to be a fighter. What do you tell them? My kids, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want them to become a fighter because I know how hard it is. But if they want to become a fighter, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish on them. But if they do want it, and I see that they could do at least pretty good because as fighters, these guys are started. And you can see that they're not going, they're going to get hurt. All then as far as that started, and then you can see that he has a little potential. Doesn't mean that you, just because I was a champion, they going, you know, they could become a good fighter. I, I don't think I, so. I, I tell you what I do. What I do, what I'm doing to my son, is giving him, offering him many more options than the than the ones I had when I was a kid, and I, I just rely on his intelligence to make his own choice. And I'm sure that if you have options available to you, that boxing would not be on the first three or four. I, well, yes, I wouldn't Marcus necessarily Black. say that, because okay. then you're stipulating that boxing is, is bad and you shouldn't box. Uh, if it was my kid, and my kid said he wanted to box, I think my kid would have an advantage because I was in the sport. And that advantage would lead him into a better guidance into, into the boxing world, especially as a professional. Uh, he, he will have a better advantage of knowing what to look for and what to look at, and maybe in his connection in boxing, that whereas though you can guide your child and put your child into the hands of someone, a promoter, a manager, or whoever, that would sincerely take a step, no, a step further in just promoting your son. But, but caring for your son and hoping that your son would do his best, okay, and, and, and looking at the whole scenario of the sports, inside of boxing and out, and guiding them inside the ring and out. Richie, as a police officer, you're on the mean streets of 
Brooklyn and New York every day. What do you say to the kids when they look at you and say, Tyson's still my hero? Basically, I tell them, Tyson is Tyson, and you can't base boxing solely on him. You know, you have to deal with yourself. You know, so they say, look at me, I'm just an ordinary police officer. But I box, you can box, you know. Have your own little role model, have you as your role model, you know. You can Good look point. at me, if you don't want to become a cop, that's cool. But look at yourself, don't look at anybody else, look at yourself. You know, and, and based, you know, on that, mm -hmm. they do what they want. I have two sons. Neither of my sons, with all of my uh, involvement in boxing, showed an interest in boxing. But if either of them had shown an interest, and they've had other options, and I had other options growing up also, I would, I would be overjoyed. Because I feel that boxing, like any other sport, has its downside, has its injuries. But I think that I would have also encourages them, encouraged them, like I was encouraged, to get an education along with the boxing mm -hmm. so that they would have something else to fall back on. You know, they would have been in a position to avoid some of the pitfalls that so many of our, of our fighters have fallen into over the years. But I certainly would have been overjoyed if any one of my sons uh, had wanted to box. See, boxing offers a dream allows a young man to dream. He sees a Michael Spinks, he sees Vito, he sees Mo Blocker. He sees them reach a height where he, 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 he may not have had what it took to get into college uh, or whatever, but he can go to a local gym and he can have a dream. And a man without a dream is limited, but he can have a dream that one day he can help uplift himself his loved ones, change his whole life. And basically, from what comes naturally from his environment, and that's how to box. And it goes back to gladiator time. That's why people, all, boxing gets the exposure it does because it's something that comes natural. But a kid can walk into a gymnasium like this and with a dream, perhaps one day, change his life and those of his loved ones. And that's a grave difference. Unlike in professional football, baseball, basketball, those sort of things, uh, 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 you, you, can, you, can, you can walk in right off the street, a little scrawny kid. Uh, let me give you a perfect example, that of Muhammad Ali, which was spurred into a gym because somebody took his bicycle. But it turned around where he walked into a gym trying to get his tools together to go out and if he finds the guy, be able to deal with him in the street. The story need not be told, the greatest of all time. All right, where, where do we go from here in, in the sport of boxing or the business of boxing, as it were? Where do we go? It's from definitely here? a big business. All right. well, you know, big business. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he knows about that as a promoter, but I want to tell you something. Before, when you were discussing the fact that a person can take a young boy, and he used the word program because he heard Mike Tyson using the word, I was programmed to do this and that. I knew one person, Cos de Amaro, who felt that it was impossible for a young person to reach the top unless he was an intelligent person. And he did not disassociate his behavior outside of him with his capacity to learn how to become a fighter. In other words, he felt, first of all, one, that if he was a dummy, he could help him the most he could but that dummy could not become champion of the world. Cos felt that way, that was his theory. He also felt that behavior, that if you take all these ingredients, those components of cheating and lying, and you transpose that into the ring, you can become champion of the world. But you cannot have those same qualities outside the ring because it would, it would put you in jail. So Cos did not disassociate one from the other. You have to be a good human being he wanted to be champion of the world. So if Cuss had lived, yeah. then this would never have happened to Mike Tyson. That's what well, you're saying. Well, okay. That's too probably, strong. Probably, strong. Probably, strong. Would say, yeah. probably wouldn't have happened. No, the thing is, this deal. Tyson, he was <laughs> built to become champion and not really to become uh, a regular human being. All the respect to Cuss the matter, he, 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 tried to, he tried to do as much as he could. But his main idea of Cuss was to make this guy champion. We all know historically the sport of boxing has always found a way to survive. Now, a few years ago, we were all talking about how great Mike Tyson uh, was 
and is, still is. And we said, you know, the, the kid that's going to beat Mike Tyson is like five years right. old in the gym today. Right. So within the next year or so, that kid is going to be 17 or 18 or 19 years old. That's the new personality, whoever he is, wherever he is. We said the same thing about Ali. What's going to happen to boxing when Ali is gone? Long came Mike Tyson. We can go back, we can go back years, decades. There's always been that one personality or that two or three personalities that comes along in our sport that keeps us on an even keel and then elevates us and then we come back to an even keel exactly. again. Boxing has always been able to survive because of the personalities that are in the gyms developing over the years that take the place, takes the place of the great ones who move on. Let me ask you this. What do you Absolutely. see uh, right Absolutely. now as the dream fight as a promoter? The dream fight uh, right now is, is, is not, not, on, not on the table. It's, it's just not there. Uh, in, in, in fact, I mean, when, when Caesar's Palace announced Tyson Hollifield, people sent their checks and their money in to get tickets right away and sell out so forth and so on. And after the fight was postponed, people didn't want the refund. They wanted their money to stay right there. Don't take, don't give my money back because I don't want to miss this fight. So right now, like in anything else, the drama has to build, you know, the, the, the pushing and shoving uh, has to start and the personalities start to come into play. That, that's why, if it had not right now, and, and, and I love the guy, I got the utmost respect for him, but our present heavyweight champion of the world generates his monies based on whom he's fighting rather than the following he's a nice guy uh in and out of the ring represents boxing very very well but without george foreman there would not have been a 20 million dollar payday for hollifield without mike tyson hollifield cannot make 30 million dollars so he needs opponents so you have to once it takes form and, and, and it starts to shake itself down, they'll, they'll rise to the top, they'll rise to the top and there will be a That's, that's a, true. A, a, oh, a but fight even, that even if the guy, even, even if uh, uh, there are famous champions like John Lewis, right. whose opposition also brought a lot of money, even though he was the main guy, right. uh, like Max, uh, Max Schmeling, you know? Mm -hmm. and, well, you know, but, you know, but, but, in the but super, you're right. Yeah, you're in right. this case, I don't, I don't know if you would want to call this the dream fight. I don't know what your interpretation of dream fight, but I can tell you what I think it's the sweet, biggest, lot of money, the biggest money fight right now, in my opinion, believe it or not, would be George Foreman, and Larry Holmes. I agree. Don't go away. We have much, much more to tell you about. Donald Trump attempted to do his proposal to have uh, have Tyson fight and uh, donate the money. How do you feel about that, Mike? And then we'll go to Vito and uh, okay. Jose, and we'll go down the line with your opinions on that. I, I, I don't know what to say about it, honestly. Um, it sounds like a good idea, I mean, uh, but I, I, I have no response to that. Okay, Vito? Well, I think if that's what Donald Trump wants to do, in other words, get the whole purse that Tyson makes and donate to needy people i think that's a great good punishment to get i believe that is the worst thing in the world his suggestion because what he's saying is that people with money can get away and poor people cannot i think that mike tyson should get a protection uh, an order of protection from from uh from the uh, this guy uh, uh from from donald trump, uh, from donald trump I'm from Don King, and he'll be okay. Mm -hmm. It's a blocker. Because you made me. I, <laughs> <laughs> he was out of place. Just, just plain, simple to the point, I think he was just out of place in making that statement. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I used to think he was a pretty good businessman, but I, I felt that was a, a business deal that he just tried to run into not thinking that he think, well, if I get Mike Tyson off, he'll fight some more fights in my casinos, generate me some money. So I'm think, thinking off the top of his head, he just threw that tool and not thinking about what he was doing. Well, as always, I don't think Donald ever shies away from publicity, and it might have been an opportune time for him to make headlines. But, but more than that, he actually, in my opinion, not helped Mike Tyson. He hurt 
Mike Tyson's position because now I'm the judge. I'm sitting there in the Midwest where he is the so-called Donald Trump, Donald Schmump, whatever he is, telling me how I'm going to should handle this. What qualifies Donald Trump because he built some buildings and he owns a casino? Please. So now I'm saying, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to sentence Mike Tyson to 43 zillion years. You know what I mean? So it, I think it, in fact, hurt Mike Tyson for Donald Trump to do what he did. I feel that any solution that suggests the use of money as a buyout of time or influencing the, the judge of the state of Indiana in the sentencing process can only hurt Mike more than help Mike. I think that Mike needs to uh, consider some very uh, competent legal people, not that the people that he didn't have weren't, but that's, and let them work out whatever types of deals or solutions to whatever's left Man, in his problem. Lost, so in my opinion, they were incompetent. <laughs> well, if that, if, that legal, if that legal defense was a fight, they would have stopped it oh. in the first round. Well, I didn't Ooh. want to say incompetent because I didn't want to get sued. Hey, well, I ain't, look, uh, I, uh, I, I, hey, they, but this is just my opinion. Uh, I mean, okay. I mean this is America. In the waning moments, and we are just about running out of time, I know that you all love the sport of boxing, but what is it that you would like to see change to improve the sport? Michael, yes. from a boxer standpoint, yes. uh, what do I like about the business and what do I think, uh, what should we change in changed. the business? Well, of course I like all the, the competition and things of, of, the, of that nature, being a boxer myself, but there's a lot of things uh, that can be changed uh, in boxing to make it better, uh, but to cover every one of them, I Yes, I, just, I just the top priorities, maybe one on each? Uh, I guess the concern for the boxers themselves, that, that's one that could make it, the sport a lot better, the concern for the, the athletes. And uh, that right there, mm -hmm. uh, for, for starters. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, boxing should, should go on forever. They, what they should make a little more safer. Uh, why not, they, they, they put headgears for the Olympics. Why don't they put headgears for professional boxing? Because guys get knocked out when they get it mostly on the chin. Not on top of it, guys get brain damage when they get it on, on the head. Not when they get it on the chin. So I think they could put headgears on professional boxing and it would save a lot of brain damage. I think for the first time in my life, since this whole situation with Tyson, I feel that boxing needs more strict supervision. I do not think that any fighter should be forced to sign a contract with a promoter for five or six or 10 years or for the rest of their life because the promoters are not there to look for the best interest of that fighter. The promoter is there to make money for the promotion. Butch Lewis did such a great job with the champ here, and I love him for the job he did because he was his personal manager, not because he was the promoter, his personal manager, he protected him as a personal manager. I think that to eliminate multi-contract with promoters and let the promoters fight to give the best the money to the fighter, that should be a basic and fundamental change in boxing. Uh, I think boxing is a, it's a it's a beautiful strategic sport. It's uh, to me I I, I will uh, sum up boxing as a, a chess game, but a, a very physical chess game. You have to think in order to perform, in order for people to appreciate what you're actually doing inside of the ring. It's a boxing sport, not a fighting sport, and I think that would intrigue fighters that's in the sport and that's doing for that's doing the sport. As far as for the boxers, I think that they should be at, looked after a little more health-wise, insurance-wise, or whatever. It's a professional sport. People live off this sport. They, pro they provide for their families. Their family depends on the income of the sport of boxing. And I think it should go into a little step further, a little depth, as far as the, the, just the security of, of the professional boxer. Boxing has been under the microscope from day one, from centuries ago, and it's going to continue to be under the microscope. But that's all right, that's the mystique in boxing. Uh, I think the, the promoters or whoever that generate so much funds from cable TV or whatever, 
should put some of this money that they get, a small percentage, in like a trust fund for boxes for like when they retire or whatever. You know, whoever have retina damage, things like that, they can um, take the money out of there. Because a lot of boxes go broke and go blind or whatever. You know, other than that, boxing is great. Well, I'm, I'm the only promoter that has to be, to be sitting here. And I really don't appreciate this blanket being thrown over promoters. One, uh, certainly, to, and, and I've been, I've been uh, criticized because I have looked out for the boxer, gone overboard to see that the boxer, anyone that boxed under the Butch Lewis Productions banner, that they were looked out for uh, as if we switched places and I were the boxer and they were looking out for me. But two, one thing we don't want to forget, nothing that I know of is all wrong or all right. So when you talk about it, you say specific, there are some, there are those. But we as a promoter, example, Michael Spinks, I had him since he came out of the Olympics in 1976. But in building Michael Spinks to the light heavyweight championship of the world, and then with 11 successful title defenses, making history, becoming the first heavyweight champion of the world, there was an investment as a promoter that I had those contracts that Jose talks about. Not everybody's a Michael Spinks. Mike and I didn't have to have a contract. Maurice Block and I don't have to have a contract. That's the relationship I had with my boxers. But as a whole, and I'm not here defending any one particular promoter, when you take a kid that's 0-0 in a four-round boxing match up to a world title, you as a promoter have invested. You pay for hotel rooms, airfares, meals, the arrangements, all that you see when the final product is there, that's an investment. You don't make, we don't make money off of these kids four, six, eight, ten rounds, right? Till they become a certain caliber. You know that, Jose. It's an investment. So why do I, and it's happened to me, I invested in, in boxers like a Greg Page and, 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 and taking him from O and O to number one in the world and then someone else runs in, tries to get him to break contract with me, my, my only option is to go in the court, say, hey, your honor, look, judge, whole lot of money, sweat, blood, and tears, and now Bushy come in and take my fight. You know what I mean? I don't play that. But when you're saying a world sport like boxing, well, you can't say, well, we're going to look out for our guys here. But what about, the guy, what about the kid from Italy, from Argentina, from South America, from Puerto Rico? I mean, they all play the same. They're in this sport. It's, in fact, a real world sport. So that's been some of the, the, the reasons why this has yet to happen, because it is a world sport. Well, first off, the first part of that question, uh, I think I like, I like the sport of boxing, because I think, like other sports, uh, it offers... Uh, youngsters an opportunity for character building and sense of cooperation and sense of self-achievement. Also, um, I believe that some of the things that need to be changed in the sport of boxing is one, I like to see a, a, a type of rating system that uh, will, will get the best and most worthy fighters into the top ten. I would like to see the elimination of some of these... Um, Are you saying that's not happening now? Well, I, I don't think that it's, it's really happening uh, in a manner that all of us would like to see it happen. You know, we see fighters who toil in the vineyard for years, never getting to the ratings. Yet we see fighters who we've never heard of fighting for a world title. Okay? So we know that that needs to be changed. And I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just saying what I think needs to be changed. I also would like to see, uh, as Mr. Lewis, as Butch has said, a, 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 a system by which there is something that will take care of a fighter once his fighting days are over. And I would also like to see the elimination of some of these uh, weight classes that have no meaning. Uh, uh, and I think in doing so, we will rekindle a renewed interest in the right. sport of boxing. You know, we got, we got weight classes that, that, that sometimes you don't, you, we have almost 57, 60, 65 world champions. If you asked everybody on this panel, not one of us can name all the world champions Absolutely. today in boxing. Right. And, and, and we make our And what that in. does, it, 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 it diminishes the worth of a title. It waters it down. There was a time when everyone in boxing, actively in boxing, knew who the, champion, the right. heavyweight champion boom, was. Boom, boom. I'm a boxing commissioner in a very busy boxing state. And I don't know who all the champions are. Right. And, I, and I say that with all honesty. So I, these are things that are, 
that really need to be changed that hit at the core of some of the criticisms of our sport. Okay. Well, uh, on behalf of Jerry and Mr. Well, and myself, we'd like to thank you for being our guest <laughs> yes, on this program. Pleasure. I hope some of the fog and passion that has blanketed this very controversial Tyson issue has been cleared up for you. I know my questions have been answered, most of them. Very soon now, Mike Tyson faces destiny in a courtroom. Maybe boxing's destiny stands alongside him. Well, thank you, Jerry. It certainly has been a pleasure working with you. And I would like to thank all of our guests today. And of course, we'd also like to thank the famous Gallagher's Gym in Richmond Hill, Queens for their accommodations. And most of all, we'd like to thank you for watching.